Yeah, it seems like you're coming down with a cold. Yeah, I am. I think you should take some vitamin C. I swear by it. Every time I've had a cold and I've taken vitamin C, it makes me feel much better. I'll look into that. I want to hit line drive. Want to lose weight and keep it? When Kate finishes her orange juice, she still won't have consumed all the vitamin C that's in one tablet of Airborne. Both are great for supporting your immune system, but each serving of Airborne has a lot less calories. What is going on? Why is everyone so obsessed with vitamin C? I've heard about vitamin C curing colds my entire life, but does it actually work? I believe in both Western and alternative medicine, but I'm always skeptical about quick-fix health claims like this. Clearly vitamin C isn't a miracle drug, or we would all be popping pills every day. Oh wait, we are. So why did we decide that vitamin C was our one true savior? Linus Pauling. He is solely responsible for getting the public hooked on vitamin C. But why believe him? Linus Pauling is regarded by many as the most important scientist of the 20th century. We're talking Einstein level. And he is the only person in the world to win two unshared Nobel Prizes. If ever there were a scientist worthy of celebrity, it's him. He wrote the book on modern chemistry, literally. The Nature of the Chemical Bond is one of the most popular textbooks in the world. And he is also credited with helping end nuclear weapons testing, which spurred his fierce career as a peace activist. So in 1970, when he wrote the book Vitamin C in the Common Cold, it's no wonder the public believed him. Pauling was turned on to the subject by a colleague, and after he and his wife claimed they stopped getting cold while taking vitamin C, he became convinced of its curative power. But the medical community was not so welcoming of his theories. He was, after all, a chemist, not a doctor. For the next 30 years, he was the center of controversy, his claims about vitamin C constantly failing the rigors of clinical trials. But thanks to that best-selling book, the public was convinced. The damage was done. Coincidentally, Pauling was teaching at Stanford University at the same time as my grandfather in the early 1970s, right when all this was going on. And both my parents, students there at the time, heard him lecture about chemistry and politics. My grandpa says that people thought Pauling's vitamin C obsession was simply a quirk, but everything else about him was fine. So it's not like he fell off his rocker in his old age. He was completely lucid and continued to do scientific research until he died in 1994, at the age of 93. Linus Pauling truly believed in the power of vitamin C and defended it to the very end. So was he right? Eh, not so much. I scoured the internet for information from reputable sources like PubMed and medical journals, and even poked around on alternative medicine sites. But from my research, I couldn't find any hard evidence that vitamin C prevents or cures colds. And that's after 65 years of clinical trials. The Cochrane Collaboration reviewed those trials in 2010 and concluded that the failure of vitamin C supplementation to reduce the incidence of colds in the general population indicates that routine prophylaxis is not justified. Which means taking vitamin C every morning is not going to prevent you from getting sick. However, there is a link between vitamin C and the severity and duration of colds. But don't get your hopes up. The most it can do is shorten a cold by about a day. And that's it. Great. So we never have to take vitamin C again. Maybe I'll save enough money to buy health insurance. But let's not be too rash. Guess what happens when you don't get any vitamin C? You die of scurvy. Sailors found that out the hard way. The heyday of scurvy was the age of discovery, when European empires started sailing the globe in search of new lands. This meant going without fresh food for months or even years. So sailors fell severely ill and quickly. Scurvy symptoms include fatigue, swollen and discolored limbs, spontaneous oh. bruising, bleeding from the mouth, nose, oh. eyes, ears, oh. and genitals, 
then jaundice, fever, heart failure, and eventually death. And all this can happen in less than three months. And the best part? All your old wounds and scars open up. Delightful. Discovering the cure for scurvy was an exceptionally long process because several issues kept undermining the correct theory. When James Lynn discovered that citrus prevented scurvy, officials tried serving concentrated lime juice, but boiling it down or distilling it through copper pipes denatured the vitamin C. That mistake threw them off course for nearly 50 years. But eventually, the British Royal Navy implemented a daily ration of limes for all sailors, hence the nickname Limeys. But scurvy was still confusing. Many thought any acid would do, and some were even convinced it was caused by bacteria. Finally, in 1932, vitamin C was isolated and scurvy was proven to be a vitamin deficiency disease. Vitamin C was named ascorbic acid for its anti-scorbutic properties, meaning it fights the symptoms of scurvy. However, the discovery would have taken a lot longer had researchers not accidentally and quite luckily chosen guinea pigs as their test subjects, the only lab animal that actually shows susceptibility to scurvy. Guinea pigs, like humans, can't produce their own vitamin C. But we're not the only ones. If we look at the tree of life, we can follow the evolution of vitamin C biosynthesis. This diagram shows time progressing radially, with forms of life evolving from left to right. Plants were the first to produce vitamin C, but invertebrates weren't that lucky. So all crustaceans, insects, and worms gotta eat it too. Primitive fish like sharks and sturgeon were the first animals to generate vitamin C. But when bony fish evolved, they lost this ability. That's 96% of all living fish. But the ability reappeared in ancestors of reptiles and amphibians, and they in turn passed it along to birds and mammals. However, certain species have once again lost the capability, including some passerine birds, bats, guinea pigs, capybaras, monkeys, apes, and humans. We are the 99%. So what are we missing out on? To answer that, I'll have to jump into the daunting world of biochemistry. It's going to take a lot of research, hours of reading, long nights at the library. Psh, please, who still goes to the library? Anyway, here's what I found out. Vitamin C acts as a reducing agent, donating electrons during many biochemical reactions. Here is its molecular form, represented by fruit. Oranges are carbon, lemons are oxygen, and limes hydrogen. This is ascorbic acid in its normal form, but when it donates electrons, two hydrogen atoms split off from the bottom and the molecule becomes dehydroascorbic acid. The hydrogen atoms are now free to attach to iron and copper atoms in other molecules. Vitamin C is now open for business as an antioxidant and can accept electrons from free radicals. This reaction happens constantly throughout our bodies and contributes to the biosynthesis of many important enzymes. Vitamin C produces collagen to make scar tissue, blood vessels, and cartilage. It controls our heart rate, modulates stress levels, burns fat, produces hormones, pumps iron into red blood cells, strengthens white blood cells, controls stomach acids, and it even helps mediate our sense of pain, touch, and temperature. So how much vitamin C do we need? The World Health Organization recommends 45 milligrams. In the United States, the recommended daily amount is 75 milligrams for women and 90 for men. But these numbers are only the amount needed to prevent scurvy. Most medical professionals say we need at least 200 milligrams for healthy bodily function. And that's about our limit too. It turns out that when we consume more than 200 milligrams, our kidneys filter out the excess and we excrete it in our urine. Because of the historical link between scurvy and limes, it is commonly believed that citrus fruits have the highest concentrations of vitamin C, but they don't. There's a lot of other fruits and vegetables that contain much more vitamin C. Let's compare these foods to the recommended dose of vitamin C. 
A baked potato has as much as a lime. One cup of raspberries has as much as a lemon. And a cup of chestnuts has even more. Next on the list come kale and cantaloupe, followed by orange, kiwi, mango, and pineapple. If you want even more, choose from a cup of cooked Brussels sprouts or broccoli, or a fresh cup of strawberries. And finally, the big hitters, a hot chili pepper, guava, bell pepper, or papaya. If those aren't enough, or you're some sort of vitamin C junkie, find some rose hips, a baobab fruit, acerola, camu camu, or gubinji berries. But it might not be worth the trouble, since you're gonna pee most of it out anyway. If you're still convinced you need extra vitamin C, it's clearly not very hard to get it all from food. And getting it from plants means you're also getting tons of other vitamins and minerals. But plenty of people are used to taking vitamin C supplements. Be warned that the average supplement dose, 1,000 milligrams, is enough to give you an upset stomach and diarrhea, or what the industry likes to call bowel tolerance. The only good thing about the drink mixes is that you're incidentally drinking water, which really does help when you're sick. And let's not forget the amazing placebo effect. If your mind is convinced something is making you better, your body will follow suit and ramp up your immune system, whether the medicine is effective or not. The problem is that advertising, pop culture, and hearsay have turned the term vitamin C into a buzzword, a miracle drug that will cure all your ills. But guess what? They're wrong. And sometimes they get caught. Airborne had to pay $23 million because of the false claims it made on its packaging. A nutritionist who evaluated Airborne as part of the investigation said brilliantly, there's nothing you can swallow, no vitamin, no mineral, no herb, that will instantly protect you. The immune system doesn't work that way. The supplement industry is just perpetuating a myth that runs deep within our modern psyche. We think pills can cure everything. We don't have time to eat healthy food, so we pop pills instead. Especially when told to do so by people like Linus Pauling. But just because he was brilliant in one subject doesn't make him an expert in another. My scientific side keeps telling me, the simplest explanation is usually the right one. And in this case, it seems your best bet to stay healthy is just to eat your fruits and vegetables. So when it comes to getting my daily dose of vitamins, I know which one I'm going to pick. <laughs>